All right, here we go. Let's see, are we all in there? Perfect. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jillian. I'm the founder of Sharks for Kids, and we're really excited to be back again at the Bimini Shark Lab. So we're on the little island of Bimini. It's about 50 miles from the U.S., part of the Bahamas, and um, the reason we're here are sharks. So the lab was built in 1990 as a base for Dog River's research on lemon sharks. Bimini is a really special place, um, and you're able to study lemon sharks from birth all the way to being adult, uh, so it's really ideal to learn a lot about these animals. Um, so today we're going to talk to you a little bit about how we actually study sharks. So I'm going to go ahead and let the team introduce themselves. Hi guys, my name is Chessie, I'm the Outreach Coordinator at Bimini Shark Club. I'm from London, England, and my job here is to be involved with the community, and I'm, uh, I help with education, and I lead a lot of the opportunities offered at the lab. Hi there, I'm Angela, um, I'm from the UK, I'm a manager here, and my job is to take care of kind of all the visiting scientists, um, the interns that we have here, and just make sure that we have everything to keep this research facility running smoothly. Hi guys, my name is Dan. I'm from Minnesota. I'm a volunteer here at the Shark Lab. Uh, I basically assist everyone, both students and staff, with their work and assisting in uh, shark handling, workups, things like that. Cool. All right, let's see. There we go. Get the camera straight for everybody. All right, so uh, we'd like to now introduce the groups that are joining us. So when you hear your class name or your group name, please go ahead, unmute your microphone, say a big hello to everyone. Um, we're going to start out with Miss Moore's homeschool students. Joining us from Florida. We do. Hi. Hi guys. Hi. 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 All right. And then next up, we have Miss Webb's class in Georgia. Hello, Miss Webb's class. Hi. Hi. All right, great. And then we have Miss James. Are you able to hear us, Miss James? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have Miss, and you guys are joining us from Texas. We have Miss Hawthorne's students from Tennessee. Hi, guys. Hi. All right. And Miss Dudley's students from Texas. I don't know if she's back. I know they were having some technical issues, so hopefully she'll be able to join us. All right. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, so today what we're going to talk a little bit about is how we actually study sharks, um, some of the equipment we use, and why do we study sharks? What are the questions we're trying to answer? What do we want to learn? And in order to do that, um, we have a special guest that's going to help us today. So I'm going to go ahead and bring our special guest over. All right, let's see if you guys can see here. All right, so this is a nurse shark. And we've got um, him or her, we'll figure out in a minute, in the tub of water. And here at the lab, um, if you think about the pasture or fence outside where people are like horses or pigs or cows, out back behind the building is the ocean, and there's a fenced in area, a pen, and instead of horses or cows, there are little sharks in there. And the lab will keep them for about 30 days. The general public can come visit the lab. So if you guys are ever in Bimini or interested in learning more, you can come visit, take a tour. Uh, volunteers learn how to safely handle and work with the sharks. And then certain research projects are done. And then the sharks are released to the spot they were captured. It's kind of like a spa visit. They're nice and safe from predators. They get fed um, and get to learn about them. So this little shark will be part of that for about a month and then get to go back out into the ocean um, and go on its way. So first thing you might have noticed, a shark looks a little bit different from other sharks you might have seen before. So uh, we're going to go through the anatomy of this particular species. Then we're going to talk about some of the equipment that we use. Then we're going to do a scientific workout. And this is the data collection. It's like information from the shark. And you can think of it as going to the doctor and getting a physical or a checkup. So we're going to take you through that. 
All right, but first thing we're going to get started talking a little bit about kind of some of the characteristics that make this shark so unique. Okay, guys, I'm going to walk you through the anatomy of a nose shark. So, first of all, you may notice the coloring of the nose shark. So, they usually are usually either um, kind of gray browny, um, but when they're born, they're actually born with a lot of spots as well, and this helps camouflage them from predators. And you can see this guy has lost his spot, so we're presuming he's around one and a half to two years old. Um, so we can start at the front of his body. So I'm just going to lift him up. Can you just... And there you can see like these little hair-like protrusions, and they're called barbels. And the barbels help the shark to feel out his environment and to kind of taste the environment around him so he can find out where his food source is. These nurse sharks live under rocks and ledges, so they actually don't need to see very well. So you can see here that it has very white eyes. Can you see that? So that means that they don't need a lot of light to be able to see, so they're able to live in um, under rocks and dark places, but they also very active at night rather than in the daytime. So this is when they feed at night. And they feed on things like um, crustaceans and mollusks. So they feed on uh, conch, lobster, crabs. So they have to have very special teeth to do this. So I'm just going to lift him up again. Okay. And it's stuck on my feet. So what they do is they have special mouth, uh, muscles around their mouth, so they can use their uh, mouth like a vacuum and they suck up their food and then they have crushing plates for teeth, very similar to the ones that we have in the back of our mouth and they use these for crushing through the shells because I'm sure you've probably all seen movies like Jaws and things like that and you see like the bigger sharks with the, the real pointy teeth, the serrated teeth. Well, they actually don't need them because of the food they eat. They just need something that can crush through a shell so they have these very flat um, teeth. So another really interesting fact about shark's teeth is that they continuously replace it. So I have a jaw. I'm going to show you. This is a different, this is a different shark. This is from a, a little black tip, which we get find around here. They're very common around um, Bimini, as are the nurse sharks. But you can see here, there's so many different rows of teeth here. And so it acts like a conveyor belt and it continuously, they are continuously being replaced. And that's because if sharks have blunt teeth, they can't feed properly. And this would mean that a, star, um, a shark could possibly starve. So it's very important that they keep replacing their teeth so they're as sharp as possible so they can um, cut through their food. So, well, here we go. So you can see here, this little nurse shark is breathing through its gills. Can you see them slits moving? So all sharks have around five to seven gills. You can only see four on this little one, but he actually has one tucked behind here. Now, they breathe by um, passing water over their gills and extracting oxygen from their gills. Um, some sharks have to breathe, have to swim, so they continuously need to be able to do this. But actually, nurse sharks have special adaptation and they can just suck in the water. And uh, so this means they don't have to swim constantly. So again, that's why you find them resting a lot of the time. Okay, we'll just grab him again. We have to be careful how we grab him. We have to grab him very carefully. And so our, our grip on them is always very gentle. Yeah. <laughs> 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 this one's uh, very active. Um, so they have all kinds of different fins. These are the pe pectoral fins. These ones help them hover and um, kind of aid them in moving along the bottom of the ocean. This is called a dorsal fin. Um, they have their pelvic fins here, which I'll explain a little bit more about. And then they have something called a caudal fin, which is their tail. Now, a lot of sharks have oops, um, like a fork tail. So it has a top and a bottom part to it. And this fork, this extra bit, gives them aids in propulsion. So a lot of sharks, like the fast swimming sharks, like makos and white sharks, they're the ones that have the double parts of their tail. This 
little guy only has the upper part, and actually they can, with nerve shots, they can get to around 25% of their body length. So it's very long, and the reason why he doesn't have that bottom part is because he doesn't swim very far or very fast. So um, they're very slow and sluggish animals, so they don't actually need that extra bit. Um, let me just grab him again. I'm just going to show you his skin. So, if you can see, get a little bit closer. I don't know if you can see that it's kind of rough kind of texture to his skin. Um, and they have something called dermal denticles, which means skin teeth. Now, these dermal denticles, they not only act as armor to protect them from um, predators, but they also act as um, a method. Oh, they lay next to each other, they're diamond shapes and they lay next to each other and with some sharks it creates what we call a laminar flow which reduces drag in the water so they're able to swim very fast uh, through the water. Now because these guys don't really swim very fast they don't have so many and they don't have this, um, so many ridges because they don't need to reduce that drag so much. Um, so mostly this, um, the dermal denticles help the, like protect them. Um, so I'm just going to show you how we can tell the difference between a, a girl and a, a male and a female. So I'm just going to lift him up and you can see the pelvic joints. There's these like um, extensions and these are called claspers. So if it was a female they would just have a little hole there and they wouldn't have these little extensions. And that's how we can tell that it's a male. Um, yeah. yeah. So I think, yeah, okay. I'm just going to pass you over to Jillian now. She's going to talk about tagging. All right. So you can see some of the features on that shark that are very different than maybe that pitted snout or that more kind of torpedo body that you think about when we think of the word shark or the animal. Um, so part of the process of studying sharks is asking certain questions and there are tools to help us answer them so you're going to see the full workup um, but part of that is giving the shark kind of a name tag um, we usually don't use names it's actually different numbered systems because all over the world scientists are catching thousands of sharks different scientists are catching them and the tags are kind of a system that people can work together but also make sure that each shark has a unique identification sort of code or we're able to catch it again or send that shark, even if you don't recognize physically, like just looking at it. So that the lab catches is a pit tag. It's very small, and you guys may have heard your parents or somebody in your family say, um, just grab this one. Um, so you may have heard them say something about a microchip. Your cat or dog may have this, and you guys can see it's super tiny, all right? And your cat or dog, if they have a, a microchip, it's that big. Right? And what we do is we put these under the shark's dorsal fin. It just goes under the skin with a, a needle, like a syringe if you've had a shot or um, an injection at the doctor's office. So when we catch the shark, we'll actually scan it. So this is a scanner. It's the same thing they have the Humane Society or the vet. And we'll actually scan. So if the shark has a tag, there's a number that will come up. Right. So it's a really long number. We're not going to have to remember that. We write it down in our data book and we can keep track of it. So uh, when you go to the store, there are items that go on the register and they scan and beep and a price comes up. It's a barcode that's linked to the price. It's kind of a barcode for a shark. Um, or your pet will have a phone number and an address. We're not trying to return lost sharks to their owners. We're just trying to have a way to give them an individual name tag. Now, other tags will go on the outside of the shark. So this is a Casey tag or a dart tag. You can see this is a little dart. It goes just under the dorsal fin, that top fin, the shark. And we take the paper off, we write our data down, and you guys can see the number that's right there. So that would be this shark's identification number. Right? So we'd have that. Shark swims off. Um, we either see it again or catch it again. Or if somebody's diving and they see one, they can take a photo of it and pass that information along. So. Again, we have to catch the shark or see it again to remeasure it, or maybe we caught it here in Bimini, but now it's in Florida, um, to learn a little bit more about their growth and movement. Now, as technology is changing, think about what a phone can do. We don't use phones just to make phone calls. We use them to watch videos, to take videos, to get directions, to look on the internet, 
right? So technology is pretty amazing, and because of that, the way we study sharks is changing as well. So this tag is an acoustic tag, meaning it makes a noise, right? So um, it doesn't play a favorite song, but it does sort of have each its own unique ringtone, but it's a series of beeps. Now, when we flip a shark upside down, they go into this sleep-like state called tonic immobility. And sharks kind of have this cavity right here where we can make a small incision, slide this in, stitch it up really quickly, um, and flip the shark over, and off they go. It's natural anesthesia, just like if you've had surgery, somebody you know, or your pet, they have to have anesthesia so you don't feel like what's going on, it does that for the shark. So it makes it really easy to be able to put that in. Now the shark can't hear this, we can't hear it, and we have to use special devices called receivers that listen just for these sounds. And when a shark or turtle or tuna swims by with this kind of tag, the receiver will record the date, the time of day, the water temperature, and the tag number. It's part of the reason we actually know which sharks are in the area, um, how long they spend there each day, and that some of them have their best buddies they like to hang out with. Right? You might not think of friends when you think of sharks, but certain species definitely have their best buddies. And the last tag um, is quite a bit larger. We have to put this on a big animal, so three meters plus, um, well over nine feet, uh, and it's going to go on the dorsal fin. It's going to be attached, and you can see it's, just, it's got a special paint on it so algae doesn't grow on it, but inside there's a mini computer and batteries, and we send the shark on its way, and anytime a tiger shark or a mako shark or a great white comes to the surface, there's a little sensor that feels the air, and it bing, sends a signal up to a satellite. It's just like getting directions in the car. It's kind of like putting an iPhone on a shark, right? But they can't cruise the internet, check their Instagram, right? They can just tell us where they are. So it allows us to track the sharks, right? If you guys have seen people talk about tracking or following the great whites or the tigers or the makos, this is the tag that they're using. So you're able to track specific sharks. And um, some of them are traveling thousands of miles. We can never swim after them. We can never follow them on a boat. So this is really, all of these are tools to help us have a better idea of what their life is like. Why they migrate, where they migrate, their diet, their habitats, where do they go to breed, where do they go to give birth. Really, all of it is a way for us to learn more about these animals in order to put better protection in place for sharks. So now, you're going to see the full workout, the rest of the data collection that when a shark is caught, scientists want to find out um, beyond just putting the tag on or in them. Hi guys! All right, hello guys. So Chessie and I are going to walk you through how we do a standard workout uh, for the nurse shark here. Uh, and when we catch these sharks uh, and we're working them up, it's really important that we get the uh, maximum amount of data, uh, of information out of them so we can uh, determine, you know, things like how long they live, where they're going, uh, what they eat, all sorts of different types of information. And in order to store that information, we use these things called data log books. So we can write down all different uh, types of information, like the uh, pit tag numbers. Um, we have things like uh, whether it's a girl or a boy, if we caught it before in the past, uh, different measurements we take on it, among a whole bunch of other things. So Chessie and I are going to perform uh, a little work up here on this nerf shark. And Angela is going to be our data collector. Now, one of the first tools we'll use, especially for the uh, smaller sharks here, is going to be uh, this little measurement trough. If you guys look in here, you can see that it is numbered with a little tape measure. So what we can do is fill this with water, pick up the nurse shark very gently, slide him or her all the way up to the front, and then we can use these numbers on the bottom to determine the length. So if we can fill that up. Just some water. Now, one of the first things we do when we actually uh, catch a new shark is we want to determine whether or not we've caught it before in the past. So, just like Julian was talking about with those pit tag numbers, we're going to take this shark and we can actually scan where that pit tag would be. So we can bring it right up there. And you can see it actually reads us a number. That number will jot down. It's a very, very long number. We're not going to memorize it. So we're going to jot that down in our data book, and that can tell us whether or not it was a new capture or a recapture. 
And the second thing we're going to do is take uh, the length measurements. Now, on Nurse Sharp, we can start out with our first one called a PCL or pre coddle line. And that's just going to be right here, right before that tail starts. I'm going to take my tool here, put it right up to that PCL, and we can see this one is 49 and a half centimeters. Another measurement we would take would be something called the fourth length, but like Angela talked about with the nurse sharks, they have this uh, really, really small lobe on the bottom, not much of anything, so on nurse sharks, we're actually going to skip that. And the final length measurement we're going to take is called the total length, so that is from the tip of the snout here all the way back to the end of the tail, and we can see this is 67 and a half centimeters. Next, what we're going to do is take our tape measure and we can actually uh, do a couple of girth measurements. So we can measure how wide around it is in various spots. So again, we're gonna take that PCL measurement here. So if I wrap this tape measure around, pinch it off, we can see that it is seven and a half centimeters. The next one we're going to do is our dorsal measurement here. So you can see we can slide this up right underneath the ridge of this dorsal fin on the top here, pinch it. That's going to be 12 centimeters. And the final one we're going to take is right underneath the armpits here, these pectoral fins that Angela was talking about earlier. So I'll slide it right underneath Chessie's hand here, pinch it off, and we've got 20 and a half centimeters. All right. Now, a final uh, measurement we won't do on this shark going to be our DNA and ISO measurements. So uh, some of uh, the sharks that we catch, we can actually take kind of like fingernail clippings. So if you guys imagine your fingernails, toenails get kind of long and you clip them off, you don't really feel it. Uh, we kind of do the same thing for a shark. We do it uh, on their dorsal fin, generally, and we just take a tiny little clip and it can measure uh, things like their DNA. So we can determine what they've eaten in the past and how uh, long ago they've eaten that certain meal. Pretty cool, huh? Awesome. Stuff. Awesome. All right. Cool. All right. So you guys can see, um, and this is done very quickly. Um, if it's a big shark, it's out. It's brought next to the boat. Everything's exactly the same, um, but we don't try and put a really big shark in a tub. Um, but with the little guys, it's much easier to actually work with them in a space like this. Um, and then this one will go back in the pen and be released soon to go out in the wild and do sharky things. All right, so the reason ultimately we're doing all of this is because about 100 million sharks are killed every single year. And that's a really big, scary number. And in order to change that, and in order to reduce the amount of sharks that are, are endangered species, we have to have this significant information um, of where they're going, habitats they're using, diet, um, patterns based on climate, or where they're going to breed, when, and things like that. And if we know that, it's definitely easy to get better protection put in place, right? Laws to protect specific species or just sharks in general. Um, the data collected from the lab over the years is part of the reason that the Bahamas, where we are, is actually a shark sanctuary. So it's illegal to catch and kill sharks here. They're protected. And that happened because this is really critical habitats for sharks throughout the Bahamas, and the lab showed that. They used their data, their science, to be able to prove that. They also helped get lemon sharks protected in Florida. Um, so it's really, really important work, and it's why scientists all over the world are studying these animals. All right, so now we're going to go through our classrooms. Um, we're going to try. We're going to start with two questions each. Um, so when we call your name. You guys have two questions, and then we'll rotate to the next classroom. All right, so we'll start out with, let's start out with Miss Moore's group. Do you guys have a couple of questions for us? No. No questions? No. Okay. No. Well, if you think of some, we'll come back to you. All right, let's okay. go to Miss West's class. You guys have two questions for us. Okay, my um, first question is, if I want to learn to be a shark, do I have to go to school for this? Can you say that again? We, I don't, we can't hear you. Okay. Um, no, if you just can, if they could speak up just a little bit.
Okay, now can you hear us? Yeah, we just, I just need to speak up just a little bit. Um, my first question is, do you have, if I wanted to be, um, if I wanted to study sharks, do I have to go to school for this? How do you learn to do this? Ah, so in order to study sharks, yeah, I mean, we've all gone to different schools and studied different, anything from biology to marine biology, um, environmental science. But the cool thing about the lab, they actually have research experience programs where anyone from the general public can come and participate and get hands-on experience to see what it's like to be a scientist for a week. So that's really cool. Um, but if you wanted to do longer studies or work with them, yeah, definitely something um, you'd want to study um, at university. So definitely. Great question. You guys have another one? Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Come here, right in here. We're getting it. Um, did you hear her? No, can you say that again? Have you seen a really big shark in the ocean? Um, can you, sorry guys, can you say it one more time? Have you seen a really big shark in the ocean? Have have we seen a really big shark in the ocean? Yes. I have. <laughs> <laughs> I used to work in the Philippines with whale sharks, and they are absolutely massive. Even the small ones are around, um, I don't know, like 12 feet, so just smaller than a little bus. But then they can get to around um, 17 meters, which is, I don't know what that is in feet, but it's the size of a big bus. And uh, they they live to around eighty years old, and they're just absolutely huge sharks, but big, beautiful giants we call them because they eat tiny plankton as well. So they're these huge giants, but they actually live on the smallest things in the ocean. Great questions. All right, thank you guys. All right, so we're gonna go on to Miss James' class. Do you have a couple of questions for us? Can you guys still hear us? Uh, we're starting to get a really big storm here. Uh, we can hear kind of thunder and lightning outside, so I don't know if our internet's still hanging in there, but hopefully it will hang in. Miss James, if you can hear us, do you want to type a question in? I don't think we can hear you, but if you want to type a question in for the um, the question bar or the chat bar on the side, we can definitely answer them. So we'll give you a couple minutes to do that. We will go to our next class. Let's have questions for us. Did we, can anyone, can you guys raise I your thumb? Can anyone still hear us? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, Miss Hawthorne, yeah. did, we, did we lose you? No, we're here. Can you hear us? Yeah, we're our signals going, but we'll try. Um, if you can go ahead, yeah, if you have a couple questions. How many sharks do you catch each year? Whoop. Actually, say it again. Yeah, we can't. It's breaking up. I'm so sorry, guys. Can you say that again? Is that really bad? How many sharks do you catch each year? Ah, uh, well, I'm gonna go with how many. I'm gonna let Chessie tell you how many sharks the lab has caught since it's been open. Okay. Because since we've been here, the lab has caught over seven thousand individual sharks. That's not the sharks we've caught kind of multiple times. That's every single day of sharks we've caught. It's quite a huge number of sharks over the thirty years we've been. And uh, we've been here working with yeah. Give thumbs up. All right, and do you guys have one more? Yeah, say it really loud. How many, have you like swim by a whale shark before? I have. I think myself and Chessie has. I used to work with whale sharks, and so I used to spend every day with them, which was an incredible experience. And then Chessie's got her own experience. 
I worked with them um, at a conservation agency in Utila in Honduras. So I actually worked on the opposite side of the world for Angela with whale sharks. Um, but we both um, have a very strong love for the, uh, for the whale sharks. They're beautiful sharks to swim with. Great question. All right, and I see Miss Jane has one in asking, why are so many sharks dying? Well, people are afraid of sharks. Sometimes they kill them because they don't like them or are afraid of them. Or people fish for sharks for the different parts of their body, including their fins, their meat. Um, oil from their liver is actually used to make a lot of beauty products, makeup and lipsticks and lotions. Um, shark products are also used in dog treats and pet food. So a lot of different reasons, but the problem is their populations are going down. They don't have lots of babies like other fish. Um, so if they're not having lots of babies and a lot of them are being killed, it's affecting their populations, which is affecting the oceans which is actually a problem for all of us. We need healthy oceans, and these sharks are the reason our oceans are staying healthy, balanced, and clean. So today, as you guys are learning about sharks, hopefully you'll share some fun facts, um, interesting uh, things that you found out, because they're not man monsters. They're actually really important animals. All right. And let's finish off with Miss Dudley's class. Do you have a couple of questions for us? Yeah, yes. Say your question. How does the shark breathe from its gills? Ah, how does the shark breathe from its gills? So these sharks, as Angela said, these sharks, can you see the, the gills moving here, up and down? So these sharks, uh, they can push water um, through. They've got special muscles. They can push water through their gills, which allows them to take the oxygen um, uh, out of the water. Um, so these sharks don't need to keep swimming to breathe. They do some little buccal pumping where they can do that. They can push the water through their gills. They don't need to keep swimming to get to breathe. Okay. Question. Do you guys have one more? Yes, we do. Come on. Uh, Say your question. How do you catch the sharks? How do you catch the sharks? Oh, that's a great question. Um, Dan, go yeah, yeah. I do that a lot, actually. Um, we have <laughs> several different methods that we use for them. So some of our big, big sharks, like this big uh, tiger sharks that we talked about earlier, we can actually set things uh, called long lines, which are, uh, if you guys have ever gone fishing before and you have your, you know, tiny, thin little fishing line, we basically have a really thick, strong, sturdy version of that. We can set it out in the ocean and we check it really, really regularly in case a shark uh, is on the hook to make sure we can work it up right away and make sure it doesn't get stressed out. Uh, for some other sharks, like our lemon sharks, we can actually catch them uh, in their habitat, right outside their habitat with big, big nets that we pull across um, uh, different stretches of the ocean. So we can go out, set those up, and we'll walk up and down the nets and uh, see if any lemon sharks run into them. Again, take them out as quickly as possible, make sure they're not stressed at all, and we can bring them back uh, to the pen that Julian was talking about. And as for our nurse sharks, we actually do uh, a really cool method of going out on boats and diving down right to where they live and under these uh, tiny little rock crevices. Uh, at the bottom of the ocean. So sometimes, you know, five, ten feet down, sometimes as many as 25 feet down. And we can actually just scoop them up while they're sleeping. Uh, so just a couple of the really cool methods of these. Cool. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. I'm glad we got it in before this storm came through. If you want to learn a little bit more about some of the opportunities, ways to get involved in the lab, check out www.bimini.sharklab.com. And you can also check out www.sharksforkids.com to get lesson plans and some additional resources to dive in even more and learn about sharks. So thank you so much for joining us today. You guys can give a big shout to everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.